Sure. All right, everybody, well, let's go ahead and get started. A uh, big thank you to Rebecca for bringing a snack for us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, today we have the special treat to hear from Dr. Nathan Schopper, who I uh, have uh, a few things to say about. So he has got his PhD from Yale, which I've heard is a decent school, or something like that. So, um, he uh, joined our faculty in 2003 and has been promoted all the way up to full professor. Uh, in 2013, he became a full professor in our department. Um, and he is also the vice chair of our department. So you know, that helps him do a whole bunch of things, and particularly in faculty development. Yeah, he does a lot with developing our younger junior faculty and helping them uh, expand and grow their careers. So we, uh, we really appreciate Nathan. And Nathan, we'll sure. turn it over. All right. Here. Yay. <laughs> To all of you to give uh, me a chance to talk about the work in, in my lab. It's always um, a pleasure to do this, but it's been a while. I was looking on my computer and, um, you know, uh, search for administrator talk, and it was 2012, yeah, last, last time I did it. Um, so I, I study uh, uh, the sense of smell in my lab, and um, I or or olfaction, and that's what I'm going to be calling it the rest of the time, olfaction. Um, and uh, um, I wish I was like Dan and had a nice picture of my twins smelling uh, to as a, as a as a way of introduction. But I have these guys um, who are probably less unruly than my kids, um, who I guess are smelling a rose. Um, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about mainly is the work research we're doing studying the olfactory system. Um, but by way of introduction, I just want to sort of outline kind of the goals of the talk here, which is uh, basically um, describe how the brain works, especially the olfactory system. Okay, um, and hopefully, uh, so one of the things I'm going to touch on near the beginning of the talk are some general principles that. Uh, um, many sensory systems work by, not just mm -hmm. olfaction, but the sense of uh, uh, sight, vision, audition, um, different sensory systems. Um, uh, near the end, I'll say something about the clinical relevance of the work, which um, especially for the grants folks here uh, is, is um, uh, maybe hopefully inspiring because it lets you know why I'm applying for NIH funding or why NIH gives gives us funding. Um, and, um, and then the last point I want to make is, is try to convey with some of the experiments I'm going to show you sort of how great our students and postdocs are because some of the experiments are, are like really hard and um, uh, they were able to do it. And uh, so, so um, hopefully this will impress upon you that that. Um, all right, so, so okay, another introductory thing. Here are the folks in my lab. Um, they uh, include two students, uh, Brittany and Shelly. Shelly, I co-mentor with Joel Zilberberg. Um, and two uh, kind of super postdocs, neither are postdocs anymore, but they include uh, Fred Huyel, uh <laughs> And um, Jennifer Board or Jen, who uh, works now sort of part time in my lab, but she she brings some special special skills that none of the rest of us none of the rest of us in the lab have. And so, even though she's part time, she definitely brings brings something important. Um, I also list here two prior students. Uh, some of you may know. Uh, at least Joe Zach, um, and some of you might know David Geyer. It's going going a little farther back, but um, so um, I, I mentioned these guys because these uh, some of the data I'm going to show you are from things they did in the lab, um, and uh, they've gone on to become relatively successful. So David is now a faculty member at um, University of Washington, um, and Joe, who's more junior. He is, he's now um, doing a postdoc at, at Harvard. Um, all right, so, so I'm gonna begin sort of the science part of this by 
sort of introducing the general problem that um, um, that's really associated with all sensory systems, okay, including olfaction, vision, audition, um, which is um, there are many things that you know are I guess problems to solve, but one of them is how we discriminate different kinds of different uh, sensory stimuli. Um, and, and maybe a, a good example would be uh, related to hearing, uh, where um, you know, if you consider the different notes, uh, we all know that the note A sounds different from, say, A flat. And we can also discriminate small differences in between those, those two notes as well. And um, it turns out that being able to tell the difference between that is not a completely trivial problem. And there are very sort of uh, um, um, uh, specific mechanisms that are involved in helping us do that. Okay? And um, I'll um, uh, and I want to talk about um, so so overall, I would say the olfactory system is kind of less well studied than other sensory systems, um, which is I guess a good thing for me. Uh, but it also probably I mean the reason for that is it's probably correctly considered to be a little less important than, say, the sense of sight. Um, but I still think it's important. Uh, and, um, and, and sort of, I'm going to actually present to you sort of um, how uh, another sensory system outside of olfaction, actually related to the sense of touch, sort of accomplish the, accomplishes this task us of helping an animal discriminate different sensory stimuli, okay? Um, and it's, it's sort of a paradigm that is now uh, well established to underlie how many different sensory systems solve this problem of discrimination, okay? Um, so so the, the system I'm gonna present you is is something that we don't have, but it has something to do with uh, what mice can do. So mice and other animals have whiskers, and um, uh, what they do with those whiskers is they move their head around and move their whiskers uh, in order to tell where they are in space uh, and also sort of locate locate objects. Okay, um, and um, so it's a it's a sensory system. Um, now, if we look at the, the, the parts of the, the, the mouse that's involved in that, um, they include, first of all, the whiskers themselves. Okay, so I don't show you the, the head of the rodent, but imagine we're looking at the head of the rodent and we have a set of whiskers. Um, and what's also shown here is a part of the cortex. So cortex is when we talk about the brain, most people are talking about the cortex and that comprises most of the brain. But so this is a part of the cortex that's involved in processing information related to this whisker system, okay? And um, what's kind of notable about this is that it's extremely well organized. So um, if you look at this cortex, you will see sort of groups of neurons that are organized into columns or People also use the word barrels because they're barrel shaped. Okay, so I show you just one neuron here, but there are many. I actually don't know the number, but let's say a million just for the sake of argument. Uh, um, and um, each of these columns corresponds to one of the whiskers here. Okay, and so if Whisker, if this column of neurons, say here, W2, that corresponds to whisker number two, gets activated, and by activated, I mean the neurons here are firing action potentials, um, that tells the animal that um, there's something close to whisker number two. Okay, so it's telling the animal, um, you know, there's something about, located about right here. Um, now, these columns of neurons include um, these blue neurons that, when excited, tells us something about what's next to the whiskers, but they also have another kind of neuron 
uh, which I'm just going to show uh, here in red. Um, so this is a neuron that's actually involved in inhibiting other neurons. Okay, so neurons fire action potentials, um, uh, and it tells us something about what's our environment, but there are also cells that inhibit action potential firing in these neurons, okay, which are involved in essentially fine-tuning the information that the animal is perceiving about the environment. Okay, so, um, and the way these are organized here is, is this way where you will have, say, within this column, you will have a set of these inhibitory cells, and I show them in red to emphasize the inhibitory nature of them, um, that these cells can get excited, and then they send axons to these neighboring columns and inhibit them, okay? Um, so how, how might this kind of work? Okay, so let's, let's, let's uh, um, kind of do a, a thought experiment here where let's imagine that the rodent has encountered a rock that physically is located there, okay? Where it's, what I'm trying to show is that it's close to, closest to whisker number two, okay? But it's, but it's also reasonably close to whisker number one and I suppose whisker number three as well. Um, and that's relevant because uh, the rodent, as it's searching around in space, it's moving its whiskers all the time. So one could imagine that as they move these whiskers, this whisker number two here would get activated the most, uh, but these other ones might also get activated, albeit to a lesser degree. Okay. Um, now in terms of activity down here in the cortex, how this looks, uh, is shown in this way. So what I'm attempting to uh, show here is uh, the column associated with whisker number two being excited and being the most excited, whereas the column here is less well excited. Okay, oops. Um, so this is where the inhibitory neurons come into play. Okay, so um, in this situation, okay, what will happen is uh, you have these blue cells, which can excite these inhibitory cells, which will inhibit cells in these other columns. Um, this, I don't show this, but this cell here will excite inhibitory cells, which will also kind of inhibit, back inhibit these other columns as well. Okay? And what ends up happening is you have a situation where you have these two columns that are um, um, sort of in competition with each other that are essentially trying to inhibit each other. And what ends up happening in that situation is that the um, strongest activated column will always out inhibit the more weakly activated ones. So if we then ask the question, um, is there any action potential firing in these cells? Uh, you will get uh, you will get action potential activity, action potentials here, but but no action potentials here at all. Okay, even though it was at least weakly excited by by uh, um, or even though the whisker corresponding to it was weakly excited by this rock. Okay, so why is this helpful for the animal? So the animal uh, needs to know where this rock is in space. Um, if without these inhibitory mechanisms, uh, it's going to, the information is, is that, that it's going to get is that it's near whisker number two and near whisker number one. Uh, and, um, and that might be kind of hard for the animal to, so, so what it really wants to know is that it's closest to whisker number two. And, because both of these columns are gonna be naturally excited, it's gonna be get confusing information about the location of that rock. And by having these, having this column inhibit this column, uh, it gets more sort of certain information that the rock is closest to um, whisker number two, okay? So, so um, 
And, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw out a term here, which is competition. So this is a situation where you have information processing, okay, that, which is helping the animal discriminate odors uh, through competition, competition between these different sort of columns of neurons. Um, and this is, if you look at all the sensory systems that have been the best studied, this is how nearly, nearly all of them work. Okay, this is how they solve the problem of discriminating very different, very similar sounds, for example, is you have these kinds of competitive interactions between certain groups of neurons. Okay, so that's kind of a general principle. Now, as for olfaction, um, um, I want to just sort of illustrate a, a, an example of, of, of where uh, a person would have a sort of discrimination, we may have trouble discriminating odors, okay? So um, let me show you these odors, or these um, foods that emit odors. They include um, spearmint and caraway seeds, okay? And it seems kind of arbitrary, but I'm showing you these because it turns out they are, um, if you look at their chemical structure, <coughs> they're uh, extremely, sen uh, extremely similar to each other. Okay, so this is spearmint and this is caraway seeds. And um, I don't know how much organic chemistry you've had, but, but um, I think you can tell by eye that oh, they look a lot alike. Um, and it turns out they are what's known as enantiomers of, of, of a compound called carbon. Okay? That doesn't really matter. The main thing is the take home is that they look uh, very much alike. So, um, Telling the difference between spearmint and caraway seeds isn't, isn't necessarily trivial because they're structurally very, very similar. Um, and and so, so this would be an example of a discrimination problem. Now, one thing I should probably say is this, this situation which is illustrated here may seem kind of artificial because I don't think any of us are ever sort of in a situation where we're presented with spearmint or caraway seeds or presented with just say spearmint and having to think, okay, is that spearmint or is that caraway seeds? We don't, we don't do that. Um, however, um, uh, when you eat say a bowl of soup that has caraway seeds in it, which I think caraway seeds go in soup or a casserole, I'm not, um, <laughs> I don't use caraway seeds in my cooking. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's important that the flavor, so, so obviously smell is related to taste, okay? Um, maybe that's not as not obvious, but this is very well established. The, the, the smell is, uh, the taste is kind of gives us very crude information about our flavor, but it's smell that tells us specifically what we're, what we're tasting. Uh, and I think it's important that if we're having a bowl of soup with say caraway seeds in it, that it always, we always get that caraway seed flavor rather than spearmint. Um, that is that we perceive a caraway seed flavor rather than a spearmint flavor because I think most of us would agree that um, if we're eating something savory like a bowl of soup, um, having a taste like caraway seeds is better than having a taste like spearmint, okay? So, so that, that's kind of how we're, well, obviously we're not actively in our brain trying to discriminate an odor, but, but uh, even, you know, even with, without our thinking about it, the brain is solving a discrimination problem when we're tasting caraway seeds every time we take a spoonful of soup, okay? Um, all right, now, um, all right, so now for sort of the kind of the kind of guts of the science part of this, uh, which I <laughs> can't get away from. Um, so I need to say something about the anatomy of the olfactory system. Um, and um, so, so, and I, so this is our odor, okay? And I've highlighted uh, in, in these uh, green boxes 
the most important structures. Okay? And they include um, the olfactory epithelium. Okay, so this is a, 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 I guess, a structure that sits, if you go, you know, think about your nose and you go inside, there, there's kind of a um, empty, vacuous space in back of that, that if you have a cold, it gets filled up with, you know, with snot. Um, but it's in back of that, that there is this olfactory epithelium where there are neurons that have receptors, called olfactory receptors, that can bind to an odorant. So, uh, and I've attempted to show that. So these receptors would obviously bind to these odorants because of the shape, shape similarity. Uh, then you have, um, the next structure is called the olfactory bulb, uh, which, uh, processes the information. So this is this is this is actually the structure I'm going to be focusing on, um, and where I'm going to be describing mechanisms for for how um, this structure helps us discriminate odors. Okay, so processes the information to help us discriminate odors, um, and then the other the last structure uh, which I'll just touch on here is is what's called the piriform cortex. So this is part of the cortex uh, that's involved in perceiving uh, an odor. So this is where, you know, you sort of have the perception, oh, I'm smelling or tasting um, spearmint or, or caraway seeds. Um, all right, so again, I'm focusing on the olfactory bowl. Make this a little more concrete. Here is... Um, the mouse brain, which is what, what I and most of the folks in the department study is, is the brains of rodents and almost in all cases, mice. Um, and I study the olfactory bulb, which kind of hangs out here in the front um, in this very kind of obvious way, right? Which is good and bad from the point of view of studying it, which I won't go into. Um, notably, if you look at a human brain, the human olfactory bulb is, um, relative to the rest of the brain, much smaller than this. For animals, it's, it, it's it, a, a large structure comprising a good part of the brain. Um, okay. So, more kind of anatomy. So, I would need to say something about the anatomy of the olfactory bulb. So, the olfactory bulb it consists of bunch of neurons of different kinds and um, this shows um, at least a few of the kind of best studied or most famous ones okay so um, they include uh, mitral cells okay, which are the, the kind of the biggest neurons here and these are mitral cells too and those are mitral cells and then there are a population of inhibitory cells in red that, uh, that are called granule cells. Okay. Um, another uh, uh, term is, um, it turns out where all this stuff is going on here, um, it includes the dendrites of many cells, and um, it's also where information from the nose is coming. Information from the nose goes into these structures first. They're called glomeruli, okay? Um, and they're little sort of spherical, uh, spherical structures that are about um, 0.1 millimeters in width. Uh, right, and then the last point I wanna make is that it turns out that the way these cells are organized is kind of like how the whisker system is organized. So if you remember the whisker system, you have different columns of neurons that, wing, that are associated with each of the whiskers. Um, each of these groups of cells here that are color-coded, okay, basically groups of mitral cells mainly, um, 
they correspond to one way, this isn't strictly true, but it's a good enough approximation. They correspond to an odor, one odor, okay? So when they get excited, when say this population of cells gets excited, say these are the cells coding for caraway seeds. When they get excited, then we perceive caraway seeds, okay? Um, and the way that they become sort of uh, odor specific has to do with, um, it isn't so much that they code for the odor itself, they code for the odor receptor that binds those odors, okay? So, so if caraway seeds had a structure that would fit really nicely here, um, and this is the group of cells that coded for this odor receptor, then you would say this is the, um, this is the group of cells coding for caraway seeds. Okay. Uh, so coming back, to, and so now I want to sort of come back to this competition idea, which, which remember I said is kind of the, the, kind of the main way the rest other sensory systems work in terms of helping us discriminate odors. Um, and the question is, um, could there be this kind of competition going on here? And the answer is that there could be, okay? And um, so, so let's do a little thought experiment and imagine the system, a system that looks like this, where these blue cells um, carry information about this odor receptor which binds to spearmint. So these are really the spearmint neurons. These cells carry information about caraway seeds, which is gonna bind most tightly um, to this odor receptor, just based on how I drew these sort of, these are just cartoon images of, you know, hypothetical images of these odors and odor receptors. Um, and why, how might you get competition? Well, if you imagine that the actual odor present is spearmint, um, it will bind tightly to this receptor here, excite these neurons to a high degree, okay? Um, it will also bind to this receptor because the shape here is um, at least loosely like this, but it will do so at a, we use the word affinity, a lower affinity, less tightly. Um, and the result of that is you get activity in these neurons, but not as strong as in these neurons. Okay, so we have then, so we have these two groups of activated neurons, and we also have these inhibitory cells, which can, I don't know why it's doing that. I think it's your connection. Right? Yeah. Um, so you have these inhibitory cells which interconnect these cells. So they can mediate competitive interactions between these two groups of cells. So what would happen here is experiment weak, strongly activates these, weakly activates these. There's competition between the two, and um, these cells are completely silenced as a result of that. Okay, so, so that helps us know that what's around us is spearmint rather than caraway seeds. Because if these cells are active, it's telling the brain that you're smelling caraway seeds. Okay. Um, so one of the things that in our lab, what, what we, what we're, one of our goals, I guess, is that this is wrong. Okay, so, so we think that um, the olfactory system is unique and it solves this discrimination problem through a different way, okay? And I'm not gonna give you the whole rationale for that, except what I'm gonna do is um, um, kind of describe some of the experiments that get at this issue. Um, and I'll just tell you sort of where we're going with this is we think that rather than um, discrimination being aided by sort of competitive interactions between these two groups of neurons. Instead, um, discrimination is aided by sort of aided by what we call local 
interactions that are happening amongst the neurons within one of these columns, okay? Um, and so in a sense, it's a simpler system where you, uh, facilitation of discrimination is um, accomplished by just one of these columns and what's going on there. Um, all right, so that leads to sort of the broad hypothesis here, which is that there is, rather than sort of this competitive model for information processing, we have a non-competitive model. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about, show you in terms of experiments, is just a few experiments that get at two questions. One is, um, what is the makeup of the neural circuitry within glomer a glomerulus that is, um, how are the cells connected to each other? What are the cells? We need to know this to kind of begin to understand what their function are, function is. Um, and then the, the, then the other question is sort of, uh, the follow-up is, could one glomerulus facilitate the discrimination of olfactory signals through non-competitive mechanisms? Okay. Um, so this is, this is how we do most of the experiments in our lab. Um, we take slices of the olfactory bulb. So this is actually an image from a rat olfactory bulb, okay? Um, we can't study the whole brain, an intact whole brain, because you can't keep it alive in a, basically in a, in a dish, because we're studying this in a, in a dish, essentially, that we put under a microscope. Um, but you can keep a thin section alive, and uh, a typical thickness is uh, 350 microns, which is a fraction of a millimeter, you know, a third of a millimeter in thickness. Um, this is what, when we're looking under the microscope, this is what we're seeing. Um, what, and what we can see is um, a bunch of cells that um, you won't, you won't see this kind of naturally. We, what we've done here is we, we injected dye into these different cells. Turns out these are all mitral cells. Okay. Um, and that was done in these experiments because my, my student who was doing these experiments, he wanted to record from, for reasons that aren't important, he wanted to record from two mitral cells that sent dendrites to the same glomerulus, okay? And um, in order to do that, he had to label a whole bunch of cells with the hope that maybe a few of them would go to the same glomerulus. And he found, he found that. So he, he would be recording from this cell here and um, one of these cells here, but I can't quite see. Okay. Um, I'll skip that. Okay, so, one more piece of anatomy, okay, before I go on, which is um, when I talk about sort of one glomerulus and the neural interactions that occur, you occur here, I need to introduce two other kinds of cells. They include uh, what we call external tufted cells, um, which are these blue cells that um, are smaller than mitral cells, okay? But they're color in blue because go to that. Um, and then the other key cell is a, a cell that's called paraglomerular cell. Uh, and there, these are tiny little cells uh, that surround the glomerulus or that are in a glomerulus that uh, are inhibitory. So these are inhibitory and they, so they inhibit action potential firing in other neurons. Um, so, going into this, we kind of knew the existence of this, but what we didn't know was how, they, how this was all connected to each other, and this kind of summarizes how they're connected, okay, which kind of, a, it's kind of a mess. Uh, the, the idea here is when there's a green arrow, uh, a green arrow corresponds to an excitatory connection that is when this neuron gets excited, it excites this downstream neuron, okay? 
And the red arrow corresponds to uh, an inhibitory effect. So these paraglomerular or PG cells, they're both excited by these ET cells, but also inhibit these ET cells. Okay. Um, so this is a mess. I just want to kind of highlight a couple things about this and how, just to give you a flavor for how we, how we, how we figured this out, right? Um, and there are different ways you can do it. Um, and we've used multiple approaches, but one of them is through what we call electro, electrophysiological recordings, okay, where um, we, use, um, we use kind of fairly sophisticated equipment that is designed to record electrical signals in neurons. Um, and the particular experiment I'm going to show you is one where um, we are recording simultaneously from an external tufted cell and a mitral cell, okay, with the goal of kind of dictating so what, what is the, um, the strength of the signal coming in from the um, olfactory sensory neuron. So this is this neuron that's coming from the nose. And as you can see, I drew this in a way where this signal is stronger than this signal. Okay, so, what, so what's the basis for that? Um, so this is a, so again, we're recording from these two cells at once. We have ways of stimulating the axons of the olfactory sensory neurons, which is happening at this arrow. And um, what we're looking for is um, an electrical signal that has the characteristics of kind of direct signaling, um, direct connections. So if you look at this, the ET cell, you can see that there's this complex signal. Um, but the key thing is that it has this little blip of current, which occurs at the same time as the stimulus. Okay? And this blip of current is um, sort of the electro, electrophysiological signature of a direct connection. Okay? Um, then there's this other kind of signal here. This is, um, this is not a direct connection. This reflects what we call a, poly, a polysynaptic connection. The mitral cells, on the other hand, they don't, they don't have this signal. They have, this is, this is a artifact of our stimulation methods. This is super fast. Um, what's missing is this, this thing here, which is a real sort of electrical signal having to do with um, dr being driven by a synapse. So this is missing in the mitral cell. So, so that um, leads us to and we also have information about the anatomy of these cells. And that leads us to drawing this arrow thicker than this arrow here. Okay. Um, the other, one other item I want to mention is, um, just thinking how far to go with this, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, is this arrow here, okay, which, uh, that's going from the ET cell to the mitral cell. Um, I drew it in this different way, and that's because, um, so this arrow reflects a synapse, and maybe you have a vague idea of what a synapse is. It's basically a sort of point-to-point -point connection from one neuron to another neuron, uh, where this neuron um, forms a synapse on this neuron, releases a neurotransmitter, okay, and that, which is a chemical, releases a chemical that then activates this, what we call postsynaptic neuron, okay? Um, and the, the synapses are kind of these very kind of well-defined structures. Um, this is what we call extrasynaptic, meaning it, it's not happening at, um, through a, what we call direct synaptic mechanism. Uh, which is why we're drawing it this way. And so how do we, how do we know that? Um, one is, um, 
we, we've done experiments where we stimulate the cell and report from the cell, and we don't get the sort of the electro, electrophysiological signature of direct transmission, that little fast blip of current I showed you before. Instead, it's this kind of very slow amorphous current. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is the um, uh, is we have information from my postdoc, Jen Bourne, who I said comes with sort of specific expertise. So her expertise that she, she, none of the rest of us have in the lab is that she does uh, what's called electron microscopy, okay, where you can get extremely high um, spatial resolution information about um, you know, anything that you're looking at. So you can see things, you can um, see these individual structures, individual synapses really well, and um, see sort of the substructure around these individual synapses. So she went out with the goal of looking for synapses from the cell to the cell and um, did not find it, okay? Which is, it's a negative result, uh, which is, uh, um, you know, not, which is in some sense a bit problematic. Maybe she just was using the wrong method in order to try to find them. Um, but we do have the electrophysiological evidence as well to indicate that those synapses don't exist. Um, and I don't need to go through that. Um, now, one other thing that Jen did. Um, so this, this, what this picture here is an image, it's called a reconstruction uh, that's based on pictures that she took with an electron microscope, so these very high resolution pictures. Um, so where she got information about um, the, the shape of this, the actual synapse that's being made here. So this is actually in green. Um, and you can get an idea, uh, the kind of scale here. This is one micron, which is a millionth of a meter. Um, and um, so she's visualizing the synapse that an ET cell, which is in yellow here, is making onto a PG cell in blue. Okay. Um, and then she's also doing Im imaging some other things. She's also sees this piece of dendrite or part of um, a mitral cell, okay? Um, which happens to be kind of running horizontally near the synapse, and that's very important. And then the last point is that the, this purple here. So this purple is what's called um, uh, uh, glia. So glia is a kind of cell that located in the brain that's not a neuron. So neurons um, fire action potentials and convey information. Okay? And they're, if you know anything about the brain, you might know, you may have a sense of what that is. Um, glial cells, they don't fire action potentials. And they have a few functions, but one of them is, is really, um, just kind of a, a structural function. So, which is I think pretty well illustrated here. So where, um, we don't have a complete image of this, but um, I think you can imagine that the way the glia here is configured is that, where, is that it's kind of surrounding this stuff here. Okay, the mitocell dendrite, the ET cell dendrite, and the PG cell dendrite along with this synapse here. Okay, um, and that's we think is important because yes. I was wondering. So, does the glia cell does it just do like the housing for all this, or does it help conduct signals at all? Um, basically, uh, it's there's some debate about how much signal conducting it does. I would say it doesn't do much, if okay. any, anything. It uh, it has. Um, it does housing, as you suggested. Yeah. Um, 
it also does, um, it has a very important function in um, soaking up the chemical neurotransmitters that are released. So um, when this releases a neurotransmitter, say it fills up this space here, okay, um, you want to get rid of it because you want the system here to, be, say, be able to respond to the next time there's a stimulus. Right. Okay. And one of the ways it gets rid of the chemical is that these glial cells um, have proteins on them that bind and soak up the neurotransmitter. Okay, cool. So, so uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, so why am I talking about all this other than that? one of the prettier pictures of this presentation. Um, uh, we think that this sort of structural here is sort of the, um, I guess, structural correlate to this sort of non or extra synaptic signaling I was telling you about uh, in the last slide. Remember I said this was non-synaptic, okay? And, and we think that the way this happens is illustrated in this cartoon here, where um, you have a synapse from the ET cell to the PG cell where the neurotransmitter is released, and it turns out the neurotransmitter is glutamate, okay? It excites these paraglomerular cells uh, because there's a very high concentration of glutamate locally here. Um, but it, it can also, the glutamate can also diffuse out of this, what we call synaptic cleft, uh, and bind to receptors on, on any other um, thing that's lying in, in close proximity to it, including a dendrite of a mitral cell, okay? And, that's, um, and you can see here that that's, that's how this looks. You have close to the site of neurotransmitter release, this synapse here, you have this mitral cell dendrite, um, you know, less than a micron, micron away. Okay, so, so this is, um, uh, so this is kind of our model for how that, you know, what's going on with this green arrow. So I'm going to try to wrap up, but I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is, um, so I said I would say something about how this is going to, this system could help us discriminate odors, right? So that's eventually where we wanted to go with this. Um, and let's see how I can do this quickly. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll just illustrate how this could happen. Okay. So let's do another thought experiment. Okay. Where we're looking at one glomerulus and this happens to be the one that carries information about this odor receptor, which binds most tightly to spearmint. So this is, this is, uh, these are the mitral cells that when they fire action potentials, we perceive spearmint. Um, <clears throat> so how would this system help us tell the difference between spearmint and this structurally closely related odor, caraway seeds? So the way this would need to work is where when spearmint binds to this, Okay, and it binds tightly. Um, you need, well, first of all, you need action potential firing to happen in the mitral cell. Okay, that's the goal. But at the same time, you need the, this other situation where if you have this other odor present, this caraway seed, which binds less tightly to this, um, that it, it inhibits spiking. Okay, and um, and the way that this, I'll just sort of illustrate how we think this works, is, is, um, is the following way, where, let's take caraway seed here. When they are around, when this is around, it binds weakly to this. It can activate these olfactory sensory neurons, but only weakly, okay? And what happens when these are weakly activated is you have uh, a situation where you have preferential excitation of this inhibitory cell, 
over this step here um, and the, the extra synaptic transmission here. Okay? And um, I won't go through the whole argument, but basically it has to do with the fact that um, when the stimulus is weak and this, say, this cell responds, but responds only weakly with, say, one action potential, um, it's releasing only a little bit of glutamate. And because it's only a little bit of glutamate, see what I have here. Uh, this is over. Sorry. Well, I'll just kind of talk, finish talking it through. Um, because it's only releasing a little bit of glutamate, there just isn't enough glutamate to reach the mitral cell. Okay, whereas because there's this direct synaptic connection to the PG cell, there's a significant amount of glutamate that, that reaches there. However, if you have um, this stimulus, this binds strongly to this and causes these cells to fire a lot of action potentials, which in turn causes these cells to fire a lot of action potentials. What then results is you get, as this cell fires action potentials, you get um, more and more glutamate accumulating in, um, we'll come back to this picture here, okay? So uh, in accumulating in this little sort of spherical volume here that's being surrounded, that's surrounded by these glial processes, okay? And we, we can show electrophysiologically that um, that happens. Um, and what, which is all this. And I will end with a few comments about clinical relevance. Um, and uh, so, so, so why does the NIH fund this? So I, I think one, worth, one point worth making is that um, NIH funds a lot of research that uh, has no uh, direct clinical relevance, okay? So they fund a lot of what we call basic science which is okay, with the premise being that, you know, we need to understand, in the case of neuroscience, you know, how the brain works in order to begin to understand sort of dysfunction during disease, right? And the brain is really complicated, and we're at the state of knowledge is that, you know, we're not really at a point where we can really begin to understand sort of diseases of the brain because we don't know how a normal brain works. Okay, so with that kind of premise in mind, especially in the area of neuroscience, the NIH funds a lot of uh, what we call basic science research, which is what I do. Um, uh, that said, there is, um, there is some known clinical relevance. Okay, so it's known that some of the main neurological disorders, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, autism, that they, um, that, um, that how these diseases first show up uh, is through deficits in olfaction. So the olfactory system, it turns out, is, is a system that is first affected in these various kinds of diseases, okay? Um, and, um, and what I did here is to kind of highlight maybe the importance of olfaction in these diseases. I did a PubMed search of olfactory discrimination and these different diseases and found a bunch of references. Okay, so there are, especially with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, there's been quite a bit of scientific study of, of olfaction as related to these diseases. Um, somewhat less so for autism, and I know autism because I actually just began a collaboration with uh, Molly Huntsman from the School of Pharmacy uh, that uh, in which we're looking at um, uh, olfactory mechanisms in a mouse model for autism. Okay. Um, all right, and so, 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 so but this, it's, it's, this is the state of knowledge, which is, with respect to diseases, is that um, you have disease X, the olfactory system doesn't work as well. You can't smell as well. It's not, but nothing is known about sort of how that comes about. Um, 
And this is where the basic science comes in. So if we can show that this little circuit here um, helps us discriminate odors, okay, um, it could lead to potential treatments for uh, odor discrimination deficits. So um, one of the things that um, I didn't really highlight, but was kind of uh, implied by a lot of what I said, is that is that these GABAergic cells, these PG cells, are, are, according to our model, very important for helping us discriminate, say, caraway seed from um, spearmint, all right? Um, it's possible that, say, patients with Alzheimer's disease, they cannot discriminate odors as well uh, because there are, say, fewer of these cells or these cells are less active or these cells don't make as many synapses as they should. Okay? And those are all plausible mechanisms. And that's the kind of thing we can study in mouse models of these diseases. Okay? One of the things we are doing. Uh, if we find that to be true, say there, there just aren't enough of these cells, for example, uh, what could we do? Well, we could... Um, we could use strategies such as drugs that could enhance the activity of these PG cells. Okay, what PG cells are there? Okay, there are fewer of them, but if we can make them more active so they release more of their inhibitory neurotransmitter, that could help. Um, and that, that could be done potentially with drugs or uh, potentially fancier, than, fancier methods, but um, certainly drugs. Um, and if we, if we find a drug, it turns out, um, if the goal is to treat olfactory problems, okay, um, people are developing, uh, methods that could be very, um, useful for, uh, basically applying drugs to treat olfactory problems. And these are intranasal delivery methods that where drugs are delivered through the nose. Um, and where those drugs will go, well, they'll first go into the olfactory epithelia, where those sensory neurons are, and then the drug will go through those sensory neurons and then go to the olfactory bulb, okay, where they could, in theory, um, say, enhance the activity of these cells. Um, and I'll, yes. Quick question for you. So we heard Suk's presentation a number of months ago, and there's clearly a lot of um, overlap, right. or, or maybe not overlap, right, but certain similarities uh, between his research. Have you collaborated with Suk at all? And his we have never collaborated. Um, we um, partly because um, we don't use. I, I would say we don't use complementary methods. We more use similar methods, and so. Um, there's less room for collaboration. Um, our sort of interests are a little different. He's very focused on um, acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, and how it modulates the olfactory bulb. How So acetylcholine, in theory, could be actually a drug that could enhance the activity of these PG cells based on things that Suk has done. So I guess... That's pointing to a possible collaboration. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So I've collaborated more with like Diego Restrepo, who does more, his methods are more complementary to mine. Um, he does like behavioral studies and um, some in vivo electrophysiology. All right, well, th th thank you everyone. And, and uh, thanks for attending and also thanks for, bigger thanks for sort of all the help that you, and support that you've given to me, me and my lab, so. All right. thank you.